podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. This is Julia Talbot, and I am welcoming you to the Department of Family and Support Services Youth Service Division, Youth Enrichment, Chicago Housing Authority Year-Round Program, RFP Applicant Webinar. Kind of a mouthful. Uh, for those of you who submitted other enrichment our, um, applications with us this morning, you made it. You all made it through. Congratulations. I hope it was a smooth process for you. And now we're going to move on to talk about the year-round enrichment program specifically targeted at Chicago Housing Authority. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. Due to the volume of participants, we're putting everybody on mute. We're going to ask that if you have questions, please submit those questions via the question box, and that we're going to respond to your questions after going through the programmatic slides. And then there'll be a little bit of a break for questions and answers. And then we're going to go through how to actually make an application in the e-procurement environment. And then we'll have questions at the end too, so you can get all your questions out. Please use the question box to note also if you're having any technical issues, just um, as so that you are aware, this uh, webinar is being recorded. It will be posted on the DFSS YouTube channel, and a link to that channel will be posted on the DFSS website um, under the funding opportunity and or alert section for this specific RFP. We currently have a lot of RFPs out, so you'll have to look for the specific CHA Youth Enrichment Year-Round Programming RFP. Click on that, but you'll go to the funding opportunity page, and when you scroll down to the bottom, you will find the link to the YouTube uh, you know, program for this art, for the recording for this, as well as a PDF copy of the slides that we're going to go through today. Please give us a couple of days to get that link ready and posted for you. It has to go through a lot of hands to get posted. So I'd say give us, you know, at least 24, if not more like, you know, 48 hours to get that posted. Um, and then enjoy it as we do. Um, so I think that's all I have to say in terms of housekeeping. Today, I'm going to be joined by an awesome team of, of some of my favorite people. We'll be joined by Ebony Campbell, who's coming from us with from the CHA today as the Director of Resident Services, our very own Maria Guzman Ropka, who is the Director of Enrichment Programs here, and Cesar Garza, who is a youth service coordinator with a wealth of institutional and uh, forensic historical knowledge of the workings of the enrichment profile. So I can't think of a better team to present what is, what is a great opportunity to provide services for some of Chicago's most, uh, most, most sort of un needing, needing of service youth. There's a better way to say that, but I'm pretty sure that somebody else can do that. I'm now going to turn this program over to this trio and uh, take it away. But first, unmute yourself. Great. I'm. I believe you all can hear me, so I'm gonna. I'm gonna proceed. Hi, everyone. My name is Maria Guzman Rochas. Julia shared, I'm the director of the enrichment portfolio. Um, and I am going to, with um, collaborating with Ebony and Caesar, walk you through our presentation today, where we'll provide you with detailed information about the CHA year round program RFP. For those of you who did apply for our other RFPs that closed at noon today, um, a lot of this will look similar, uh, but there are some very key differences that we're going to point out today. Um, and I uh, also want to give you an opportunity to ask questions. So this is our agenda today. We have a very detailed agenda, so we want to make sure we cover every single thing that you all may have questions about. Um, but also one of the key things that I can share with you all as you listen in um, to, this, to this webinar is that it is extremely important to read the RFP from page one to page, I don't know, whatever page it ends at. 
um, because a lot of the information that you'll have questions about or a lot of the information and, and issues that you'll run into is in the RFP. It, it, a lot, if not all of it, is in the RFP. There may be some clarifying questions that you all want to ask, which we're happy to answer now or happy to answer um, later on, as Julia mentioned, information that will get published in what we call the amendment, which is basically the FAQ that will come out in the next few days. Um, so we can uh, move through this. Um, the first thing that I wanted to do in the next slide is point out the, the schedule for the RFPs. I, I mentioned our year-round and school year opportunities for our enrichment portfolio ended or closed today. Um, and the contracting will begin Sunday, January 1st, and we'll hopefully make decisions in the next couple of months. We don't have an exact date yet, but that, that is going to move forward. Our CHA year round is, is uh, webinars today that launched in, or it was released July 12th, um, and the RFP is due Thursday, August 25th. You'll, you will hear this multiple times in this webinar, um, and if you communicate with us, you'll hear this multiple times as well. Do not wait until 11.50 or even the morning of August 25th to submit an RFP. Uh, we already have had instances where folks waited a little too long and unfortunately we can't do anything about it. Our system does not lend itself to uh, giving extensions or uh, creating you know, exceptions for really anyone. And so we want to encourage you all to submit it the week prior um, but also understanding that opening a new account in order to get into the system takes time. So if you have not started it already, even though it seems like, oh, we have a month, um, I would encourage you to start immediately after today's webinar um, and getting things straightened out. There's a lot of things that you still need to do in order to get that fully submitted. Um, so just a brief reminder, but there will be multiple of them. Um, and then we are launched, we are releasing two new, two other RFPs um, by this fall for summer programs. So it'll be both for our typical enrichment and then our um, CHA program we will be releasing that this summer. We don't have exact dates yet, but take a, uh, keep an eye out on those. Um, if you have not received opportunities from us before, emails about these opportunities and you found out about this webinar through something else, um, please email me and we will add you to our distribution list for when those opportunities come out. Okay, so in order to, to walk you through this, you know, we have to start with the bigger purpose of, um, of this RFP. And this is where, again, if you've submitted for the year-round program or the school year program, um, you'll notice that there are differences in the purpose of this RFP. So we are seeking to fund agencies who have experience in implementing out-of-school time programs for young people ages 6 to 21 in Chicago. This specific RFP is looking to fund delegates in, in for youth, for residents of CHA in six community areas. So we're looking at Douglas, Grand Boulevard, near Westside, Riverdale, Roseland, and Washington Park. And so the goals um, are still very similar to the general goals of the enrichment portfolio altogether, right? We, whether we're serving young people in one area or another, or that have um, one need or another, we still wanna make sure that delegates are providing youth with meaningful and enriching programming that leads to them feeling safe and supported, that builds their social, emotional, um, um, and cognitive skills and reinforces them, that develops positive relationships and belonging with peers and adults, and that provides leadership opportunities. So it's still very important for agencies, whether they're serving um, whatever types of young people they're serving, that it provides them with all of these opportunities. And we're looking to do this overall, whether it's one program model or another, to be able to engage young people in, um, in these really great enriching program, programs, implementing best practices for them in these programs. Um, so just a couple of, of slides around um, the background of out-of-school time programming. I'm probably preaching to the choir, right? You all, if you're interested in this in this opportunity, you all are, are or are interested in doing out-of-school time programming already. And so we really want to 
emphasize that we are going off of um, research-based practice and also practice-based research, right? The understanding that research has found out-of-school time programming uh, beneficial to young people in several ways, um, gives them access to caring adults, you know, promotes their health and well-being, um, that leads to these positive outcomes, including young people having a more positive self-concept, better problem-solving and decision-making skills, more interpersonal skills, et cetera, et cetera. You all are all able to read this. And like I said, I'm probably preaching to the choir. Um, but not only does it benefit young people in, in creating these opportunities um, for positive outcomes, but also the sense that there are protective factors that this participation in out-of-school time program can lend itself, including uh, fewer problems in childhood, in adolescence, lowered rates of substance abuse, fewer problem behaviors, improved performance in school, the list goes on and on. These are just really examples. Um, and programs and activities can provide these critical foundations to support healthy development and really prevent um, instances of violence, whether at the personal level or um, within the, the programs themselves and the communities these programs sit in. Um, one of the things that we, you know, we want to make sure that folks know about is um, that out of school time programs, and particularly those that were DFSS, DFSS funded in the past, have a unique ability to, to adapt and expand services to meet the, young, the needs of the young people that they serve. And a, and a lot of what happened, especially during COVID, we're coming you know, hopefully out of a pandemic, um, but our agencies understood this need for out of school time uh, programs to provide these protective factors to create these safe spaces for young people. And a lot of what our programs did was pivot to ensure that the basic needs of families were met. Um, and that was through everything from creating um, food pantries to you know, support lines to ensuring families had access to PPE. Um, and so it's really important for us at DFSS to work with agencies that understand the holistic concept of uh, serving the needs of young people. So this is just information in general about what we've done um, in this funding cycle. So this funding cycle is, as many of you who know, um, our funding cycles are about two to three years long. And so we have really understood what it is that we are, um, how it is that we're serving our young people. In 2021, we funded 400 slots to 19 year-round and summer programs. Um, and that is the number of slots we have, right? But our agencies ended up serving 487 ages 6 to 21 for the CHA grant. Um, and that, that just means that there, the need is out there that agencies are serving young people and really um, capturing what it is um, that they're doing is really important to us. Um, we conducted a survey last summer. So this is 925 youth across the enrichment portfolio. This isn't just specific to CHA youth, um, but they report having positive relationships with adults, feeling more hopeful, um, reporting, or that they reported that the program helped them strengthen or build new friendships. Um, there's data around improved skills or enhancing their skills. And that's another important piece of data that we want to capture is what are the experiences of the young people within the programs. Um, and so certainly that's something that is um, part of the information that we share and part of the information that we work with delegate agencies to collect. Um, and so in terms of the priority areas that we've mentioned about serving uh, youth in those community areas, the data that you see here is where the youth were coming from. And that just means that this is the home address that was listed in the database that we have. Um, so the majority of that, or I guess I should say half of them, come from these priority areas. And Ebony, a little, Ebony will go a little bit more into these areas themselves, um, but certainly something where we want to make sure that we are targeting programs that exist within those priority areas. Um, and so priorities for improvement are those areas that we want to continue moving towards. So one of the things that we have worked on um, in this past funding cycle and in the past few years, not just in the enrichment portfolio, but also in our other youth division programs, uh, is moving toward best practices, whether that's practice informed um, or research informed, really understanding the experiences of our, of our agencies. 
um, we want to make sure that we are aligning more with what are the best ways to serve young people and to lead to the best outcomes. Um, and so there are five that I'll I'll read because I think they're super important to consider as we think about whether you want to apply for this opportunity. Um, so first is prioritizing the enrollment of underserved youth and ensuring appropriate support and services. Um, and so that's really instrumental in thinking about the target population for the specific RFP um, and for the others if you apply for the others. What is the target population that we're looking to serve for this particular um, opportunity? Uh, the second is programming that fosters positive youth development through accessible and equitable approaches. Um, program design that continues to be more aligned with research and youth development and out of school time programming. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure that agencies keep in mind that we're not just opening the doors and offering, you know, free gym for three hours of the day um, and not really keeping in mind best practices that are out there in youth development whether you're doing project-based learning or whether you're doing um, more of a you know, cohort model-based uh, program. And so really just thinking through what is already out there, how can, if we already exist, how can we improve our programs, how can we align them more with what's out in youth development um, and best practices. Um, and then the fourth is focus programming and developmentally appropriate activities based on youth needs. Um, what we want to see is that respondents are ensuring that the activities that they propose, that the, uh, the way that they're structuring their programming really keeps in mind the age groups that they're serving. So you're not gonna serve six to 10 year olds the same way that you're gonna serve 15 to 18 year olds um, or however the, the age group separate because they have different needs and young people have different needs. It's not just about ratios. It really is about the types of activities that you are um, implementing and the way that you're implementing it, the way that you're staffing it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then finally, prioritizing continuous improvement, focusing on using data to make programmatic decisions. Um, if you are a funded delegate currently, our, you know, our learning cohorts have been more focused on data, on using data to see what it is that we, we could do better, um, what areas to celebrate. And so just ensuring that, that that's part of the plan is to utilize that type of model to make programs better. Um, so now I'm going to pass it over to Ebony Campbell from CHA and Julie introduce her. She can introduce herself as well to talk a little bit about the community areas that are the focus of this RFP and the target population. Awesome. Thank you, Maria. So hi, everyone. I'm Ebony Campbell. I'm with the Chicago Housing Authority, and I get to oversee the authority's academic achievement and economic independence impact areas. And I get to assist our residents in building their confidence, assets, and well-being. So first, I wanted to give a little background for those of you who are unfamiliar with the CHA. We are the third loud largest housing authority in the country. We kind of waver between the second and third. Right now we are the third and we serve about 63,000 families and more than 135,000 individuals through our public housing and voucher programs. Support for those families is primarily delivered out of our residence services division, which is where I work. And we focus on four impact areas, two of which I previously mentioned, and those other two include earning power and stability slash quality of life. And so particularly when it comes to our youngest residents, our young people, we know that as a houser, we do have a shared responsibility to create those opportunities, the partnerships with entities like DFSS and its delegate agencies to help our young people thrive into adulthood with the skills, with the credentials for family sustaining wages and jobs. And that's why out of school time programs are important, especially during the summer when so many young people are disconnected from the supports the services, the relationships that they need, that they count on for their education and well-being. That's a little bit about us. Um, the community areas that um, Maria mentioned, they're a little um, scattered here, but I wanted to, if I can remember, we did talk about Douglas, Grand Boulevard, near Westside, 
Riverdale, Roseland, and Washington Park. I did want to call out that these community areas <clears throat> do have a large number of CHA youth. And so roughly about 30% of our resident population within those community areas are between the ages of 6 through 21. So when I think of um, Riverdale or, or Roseland, that's where our uh, alt Gale community is in and around, our alt Gale development is in and around that development. <clears throat> we have more than um, a thousand young people within that age group um, that are eligible to be served through this RFP. Did you wanna to move to the next slide, Maria? And so uh, again, in terms of target population, uh, we talked about community areas, um, but this RFP, this program intends to serve 120 CHA youth. Uh, those priority areas again are Douglas, Grand Boulevard, near Westside, Riverdale, Roseland, and Washington Park. Because we are funded in large part by HUD, our programs are specifically for CHA residents. Uh, if you're curious about if your prospective participant is a CHA resident, CHA residents will have a client ID number. It's also referred to as a voucher number, which allows us to verify residency through our system of record. Uh, otherwise, you'll know you're a CHA resident if you're included on a lease at a CHA family, mixed income, scattered site, or senior property, or if you're renting in a private market through CHA's Housing Choice Voucher Program, which is formerly known as Section 8 Program. And I'll turn it back over to Maria. Thanks, Ebony. Um, and folks, if you have any questions, feel, please feel free to those in, um, in the chat. Um, Ebony is a great resource in information. Um, as she shared before, she's got a ton of experience um, and can really provide support in terms of some of the questions that may come up about the target population. Um, in addition to the information that Ebony just shared, this target population um, slide is very similar to our other uh, RFPs, right? So we are wanting to ensure that this population or this RFP and the applications target CHA youth residents in Chicago, um, but the overarching desire is for programs to design and deliver high quality out of school time programming um, to meet the need of children and youth through safe, supportive, interactive, and engaging youth activities. Um, regardless of who they're serving, as I mentioned before. That's really important for us. Um, and that programs use a positive youth development framework to promote learning, leadership, and positive peer-to-peer -peer social connections. You'll notice, and it's really going to come through in the following slides as well, that we're not telling you to implement a certain curriculum or telling you to do certain activities or to design programs a certain way because we, we strongly believe that different communities and different you know, equity zones in the case of the other RFPs have different needs, that young people um, are universally developing in similar ways, but that the communities and the context that they live in really guide the, the information that or the, the surroundings that they should um, be in. And so we want you to have the flexibility to create programs the way that you see fit and that you inquire in your community and you've asked parents and you've worked with schools, you've collaborated and we want to make sure that you've taken that into account, um, but that the overarching desire is that programs have these key practices. And I'll go through what those are in a second um, that are, can be implemented regardless of the type of programming that you're going to be. All right, so we'll go through the program requirements um, and Caesar will guide us through some of the staffing, but let's just start off with the, the general program requirements. Um, so here you'll see this table that is super informative. Um, we are looking at for the CHA year round program, we're looking at $1,800 per youth slot um, with the number of youth slots uh, for, with a two to 20 ratio, right? So the base cohort 
and that's a term that um, hopefully is pretty straightforward, the minimum number of young people that you can apply for slots is 20. Um, and then additional cohorts in increments of 10. So if you want to serve um, more than 20 youth, it has to be either 30, 40, 50, et cetera. Uh, and so you can look at this table to guide you, and that is then the consideration of the total grant. It would be whatever number times 1,800. In terms of program dosage and frequency, um, this is referring to the number of hours that programs must offer programs. This is not tied directly to the number of hours that you participate. Obviously, it's dependent on it, but programs must offer a minimum of 360 hours a calendar year. That is on average eight hours a week for 45 weeks. Does that mean that we are requesting eight hours a week for 45 weeks exactly? No. The flexibility here, for those of you who are familiar with our programming, is that we understand that there may be times during the calendar year where program is more concentrated. So, you know, during a you know, generic example, during the month of March, we have programming every single day for four hours a day, and that knocks out, you know, whatever that number of hours is. And then maybe in April, because it's spring break or whatever the case is, there are less hours during that month. As long as there is overall 360 hours of programming planned a calendar year, there is some flexibility around the number of hours a week. Keep in mind that year-round programs must offer programming during school breaks, um, such as spring break and winter break. Um, those are really key times for young people to have opportunities to participate in programming. And so that's a, a, a very specific requirement in this RFP, and obviously during summer. Uh, and hours may include evenings and weekends. So it doesn't have to be a traditional, you know, closed by six kind of or kind of program. You could be open until 9 p.m. depending on the, the physical location you're at, or you could offer programming on weekends as well. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility around what your program will actually look like as long as you're adhering to the requirements of um, hours of program. And then in terms of program completion, there is a goal of 80% of program dosage. So we are asking that you aim for having you participate at least 288 hours a calendar year as 80% of 360. Um, and so those are those are the year-round specific requirements. These are the program requirements for all of our programs. Um, you're looking at um, serving different age groups. And so you'll have to, in your application, if you decide to apply, you'll have to select which age groups you're looking at and you're looking at serving. And this references what I meant uh, or what I mentioned earlier around developmentally appropriate activities, right? So if you're looking if you're looking to serve the six to 10 year olds, your activities are gonna look different and should be spelled out differently than if you're looking to serve 14 to 17 year olds um, and the way that you structure your program. And respondents may select multiple age groups. You don't have to pick just one. You can select all of them, but you also need to be able to describe how you're gonna serve them differently. Um, I mentioned the staff to use ratio earlier um, and the program recruitment, we talked about that looking at the priority community areas. Um, it's also important to uh, remember that eligibility is restricted to youth who are CHA, Chicago residents, and between the ages of 6 and 21. Uh, in terms of program specialty areas, we have five listed here. We understand that programs may have multiple program specialty areas where you may do health and wellness and STEM, or you may do STEM and arts, culture and music, and that's okay, um, but the application does require you to select one. And so just keep in mind selecting maybe the primary one that you're focusing on with um, the understanding that there may be others that you, including your program, that's totally fine. Uh, and then in terms of program components, I also will read this list because this is where I was talking about best practices in development, best practices in out-of-school time programming. So whether you're doing an arts program or a health and wellness program or a college and career uh, readiness program, it's important to have 
each of these components implement or integrated into the design of your program. So creating safe and supportive spaces for youth, um, knowing what that looks like and what that means in any of these types of programs is really important. Um, fostering positive connections with caring adults. Right? It's not just about staffing and ratios, it's how you're um, training your staff, how you are um, creating opportunities for young people to connect with caring adults. Um, fostering youth voice and agency in program decision making. How are you integrating the voice of young people in the program to ensure that programming is being led by them? Um, creating activities that are designed and implementing using sequenced, active, focused, and explicit elements. Um, and if you're not familiar with those, I advise you to look into that. Uh, it's really the way that you structure activities uh, and how you implement them in your programs. Uh, consistent and intentional staff onboarding and training opportunities. Uh, that is a key piece in ensuring that program staff are retained and that they are working with the young people in the best way that they can. Uh, and then al also consistent and intentional opportunities for parent, family, and community engagement. And that goes back to this holistic sense of how you're serving the young people in your program. They just they don't just walk through the door independently. There's a lot of things that they're surrounded with and how it's surrounded by and how do you collaborate and cooperate with those different stakeholders to ensure that you know what the, their needs are and how to best serve them. Um, and I will pass it now on to Caesar, who will talk us through the rest of the program requirements. Thank you very much for, uh, for muting me. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Cesar Garza. I'm a Youth Service Coordinator in the Youth Division with Department of Family Support Services. I will talk about the program requirements uh, on the RFP pages as well. You can find them on page 10 to 13. Um, but the first thing I would like to talk about was that, uh, is basically the respondents will have to recruit, hire, and manage program staff using two to 20 staff to youth ratio. As Maria spoke about that earlier, program staff should be positive, enthusiastic, civic-minded individuals with connections to both their community and the world outside their community. Program staff should ensure um, program object objectives that are met uh, while also providing individual and group support, instruction, coaching to youth participants in culturally component environments. Uh, Many of you are familiar with CitySpan already, so we do require data entry and data collection on our CitySpan database. If you're not familiar with that, we will definitely train you. Um, preference will be given to agencies who hire program staff with experience in, and those who come from communities in which the program is located. I cannot emphasize this enough, but positive youth development, there's a lot of research out there on, on various podcasts that I've been listening to, TED Talks, numerous articles on positive youth development. I strongly encourage you to, um, to review those as well, things that are out there on the internet regarding this positive youth development. If you could please go on to the next slide, please. As we continue on their program requirements, this process needs to be started before, as it takes time to get the federal fingerprints, mandatory reporters, uh, CPR, and the first aid. Prior to the program start date, staff must have all of these. Uh, the, all this documentation must be entered once again in our CitySpan database for verification to the program start date. Uh, and I want to emphasize that staff and volunteers cannot work with youth until background checks are completed. Uh, and some staff and volunteers can volunteer staff and volunteers can only work with youth in the presence of a staff person who has a clear federal fingerprint background check. So I would like to emphasize that. Uh, this is important and gives delegates time to uh, regarding the program staff will be required to participate in the sponsored professional learning meetings. Some of you know them as the learning cohorts. Uh, during these meetings, we will learn about youth development, best practices in out-of-school time fields, 
um, staff professional development. We're gonna support you with around data and analysis on cultivation of professional and personal networks. You have, you're gonna have a chance to network with each other and learn from each other. And it's gonna be training on the city of Chicago processes and procedures. I wanna emphasize this is important and it gives delegates time to network, highlight their programs and learn from each other as we are continuously uh, learning to improve. Learning from each other is one of the good ways to, uh, to keep on learning. Um, if you could please go on to the next slide, please. Uh, program re requirements, you could find this on the RFP page 14, um, the enrichment program procedure requirements, programmatic changes. Agencies are required to notify the DFSS enrichment youth service coordinator and the director of youth services enrichment portfolio of any changes to staff facility, facility, location, or work plan in writing within seven business days. These changes must be updated in your work plan in the system database within 30 days. Um, the program written procedures, agencies, agencies are required to have written procedures for, to ident for identifying and reporting suspected child abuse or neglect. Agencies are also required to have written emergency procedures for a lost child and major minor injuries and written safety facility evaluation procedures. Uh, the program close-up procedures, DFSS close-up procedures must be followed if a DFSS funded agency program is closing for any reason. Once again, you can find this on the RFP page 14. If you could please go on to the next slide. Uh, the, port, the performance goals and outcomes. These are very important to us and we are looking for the following here, as you could see, these are some important performance indicators. We will monitor the outcomes below through our data collection from youth, the parent guardian, staff at the beginning and middle of the year. As you can see, these are several of them that are here. Uh, you could also have respondents are also welcome to add their own performance measures to the application besides these, but these, these are the ones that we that we look for. As you could see here on the bottom on to monitor and recognize intermediate progress toward the above performance indicators. The FSS also intends to track monthly output metrics from delegate agencies that include, but are not limited to the following 90% of youth class will be filled at any given time, 50 youth will meet the target criteria, 80% average daily attendance, and 85 youth will complete the year-round program at least 288 hours a year. Like we always say, young people will go with their feet, so it's very important that the average daily attendance is at 80% or above, and that you're meeting your enrollment numbers and attendance numbers. And you can find this information and the RFP page 14 and 15. And guidance for respondents. As we mentioned earlier, as Ebony mentioned, the RFP seeks respondents that can serve targeted community areas, the Douglas, Grand Boulevard, the near west side, Riverdale, Roseland, and Washington Park. Collaborative applications are strongly encouraged. The awards will be, will be made by community area. Respondents seeking funding for multiple sites in different community areas are required to apply for each community area separately. DFSS will make recommendations for contract awards by community area, balancing program location, target population, age group, and program specialty area. Respondents can only apply for a community area in which they can demonstrate a physical address. DFSS intends to award six agencies, each receiving 20 slots per contract. So as we mentioned before, the anticipated number of work sites is 120. We're gonna approximately uh, select six delegate agencies. 
Respondents are encouraged to collaborate in order to allow agencies to subcontract and expand organizations' network to deliver programming. We have many delegates doing this already with other delegates and also with um, CPS and Chicago Park Districts. The next slides. As we mentioned earlier, this table is very helpful. We reviewed the budgets as well. Respondents applying for year-round enrichment CHA RFP will budget for a rate of 1,800 per youth with a minimum of 20 youth per program in additional increments of 10 youth. The anticipated cost of a year-round program for a minimum of 20 youth is $36,000. Should respondents apply for more than the minimum of 20 youth, they can plan to increase their budget by $18,000 for an additional increment of 10 youth. Um, the budget provided below is an example of respondents and expected budget expenditures for serving 20 youth. So there's a very visual um, budget that you could um, use as an example. This is an example, like I said. And you can find more information on this on the RFP page 12. Moving on to slide 21, the budget or cost proposals, the term of the contract executed under this RFP will be from January 1st, 2023 through December 31, 2024. Administrative costs will be capped at 15% per application. Our respondents must be able to demonstrate a minimum 50% in-kind match. Please make sure you submit a budget for one year, 12 months of services. Cost category definitions are attached as the budget instructions in every RFP. Be thoughtful and inclusive when developing your budget apply for your program's actual costs. Use the reasonable cost questions on the application to discuss how you determine the costs reflected in the budget. The budget should also match your proposal if you're applying for an arts program. Make sure you have that arts and crafts included on there, art instructors, or if you're doing a sports program, make sure you include your sports equipment as well, or technology programs, whatever that might be. Please go on to slide 22. So the budget or cost proposals, common mistakes on the fringes, please check your calculations. Supplies, these are frequently under or over budgeted. Please make sure your job description titles or job description uploads have the same title. Also put a brief description of the job in the budget document itself. If you, if you had not discussed it specifically in your application, put your budget in the appropriate column, show your match, and please, please, please read the budget instructions carefully. Now I'd like to pass it on to Maria. All right, thanks, slide. Caesar. Yep, so in the next few slides, we're gonna go through the selection criteria, um, and this directly relates back to the application itself. And so these are the things in mind to keep in mind as you're completing these the different sections. Um, and hopefully this will clarify things a little bit. Uh, we want to make sure that within the community involvement um, section or really how we determine how agencies score in community involvement, that respondents demonstrate a clear understanding of the young people in the community area in which they're proposing their program location. So I, I mentioned earlier understanding the needs and challenges as well as the strengths of, and opportunities of young people within that community area. Um, we want respondents to have done their research, to have reached out to families and young people to understand what it is that they need and how the program design will be addressing that. Um, that respondents have relevant competencies, capabilities, and the infrastructure needed to provide these services to those young people. Uh, that respondents describe how the agency is seeking to be more inclusive in their internal operations um, as we continue to understand all of this um, programming, the programming aspects, 
it's also important to keep in mind that we want agencies to always be working on how they can be better and how we can keep in mind being inclusive, um, equitable, accessible, things like that. And then finally, as an organization uh, and its board, that it reflects and engages the diverse people of the community it serves. So the selection criteria, organizational capacity the, uh, for the respondent demonstrates that the program staffing is sufficient for level of services proposed. The staff are qualified, culturally competent or reflective of the communities to be served. It's adequate systems and processes to support monitoring program expenditures and fiscal controls. Has an adequate human resources capacity to hire and manage staff. And this information you could find on the RFP page 19. Uh, the strength of the proposed program section is obviously the, the what they would call the meat of your application, right? Or if you're vegetarian or vegan, like the, the main dish of what it is that you are proposing to serve. Um, so we want to make sure that there's a clear connection between proposed program activities and the outcome goals of the RFP, that respondents are providing clear and specific descriptions of how the program will incorporate each of the program components as outlined in the RFP. Those are the ones that I read um, earlier. Uh, how the program or the respondent describes how they will ensure that program acti activities are developmentally appropriate for the age groups that they're serving or that they're intending to serve, um, that the respondent clearly outlines how the proposed program will identify, recruit, and retain the youth they're proposing to serve, including how they are going to reach underserved youth. So it's not just that we're filling these slots, it's that we are ensuring that we are retaining these young people, that we are keeping their voice um, into decision-making processes that we implement so that they continue coming back. The older young people get, as you know, uh, they vote more with their feet. And so if they're not interested in the activities that you are implementing, they're not coming back. And so how are you keeping that? Uh, or how are you putting that into play? And then the, we want to make sure that respondents provide a detailed description of how the program will collaborate with other entities to provide comprehensive services. So you may be an art specific program, um, but you have the understanding that young people are not just going to be focused on art, if they're coming in with other needs. So how are you collaborating with other organizations, either formally or informally, to ensure that young people have those needs met? Um, and then finally, that respondents provide a detailed description of how they'll gather youth feedback and incorporate it into improving the program. Um, and that's that youth voice aspect. Okay, well, we'll go through this one as well. Um, in terms of performance management um, and outcomes, uh, we want to make sure that respondents demonstrate evidence of strong past performance in the same or similar programs against those desired outcome goals that Susan shared earlier um, and other notable accomplishments of providing services to young people ages 6 to 21. So if you've been implementing programs, that are that are similar and, and meet the same program requirements. Those are the kinds of things that we want to know more about. And you can add that to your application. If you're a current delegate, you can add that information to your application as well. Um, we want to ensure that respondents have relevant systems and processes needed to track and report performance on program outcomes, um, that they have the experience to use data and inform or improve its services or practices and describe a strong desire to engage in continuous improvement processes that you value this uh, idea of integrating data into decision-making is really key here. Um, and then that respondents have relevant systems and practices needed to collect and store key participant and performance data. Um, we don't necessarily collect super sensitive information um, in the grant scheme of things, but any information of young people and their families is identifying information and we wanna make sure that that is um, that agencies have systems in place and practices in place to protect that information for young people. 
Um, this next slide is around reasonable cost budget justification and leverage of funds. So this is just really ensuring is what you're proposing reasonable um, that you are requesting what you're requesting is relative to what you are um, going to be implementing and that the proposed budget supports the scope of work or work plan. Caesar mentioned earlier, if you're running an art program, uh, we wanna see that there are art supplies, that there are art instructors, and that it's relevant to the pro program that you're proposing and not something completely off or different um, so that, that doesn't go together. Uh, that respondents have the fiscal capacity as demonstrated by its auditing process to, impl to implement the proposed program and that you can leverage other funds and in-kind contributions to support the total program and administrative cost. For the most part, we don't anticipate that we're funding an entire program, right? But that there are, that, but that respondents are keeping in mind that there are other places that they can leverage funds and other um, places that they can go to to support the full cost of the program itself. Hello, everybody, once again on the selection criteria attachments. And this is very important to upload current doc. Please upload current documents. And please upload the following documents liability insurance, board member identification, SAM certification, certificate of good standing, bylaws and articles of incorporation, financial statement or the I 990 form. IRS determination letter, program budget forms, city of Chicago compliance acknowledgement form, conflict of interest, memorandum of understanding or linkages. This could be any um, linkage agreements with any other CBOs. Uh, youth coordinator or program leader job description, CPS vendor confirmation or letter of intent from school principal if program is located in a school. Be sure to attach reports, studies, or other documentation that show performance toward reaching the program goals, and demonstrate results and accomplishments. Be sure to attach the resumes for key staff that are overseeing the program. All right, and so Caesar mentioned this earlier, um, the basis of awards. So this is just really how are we going to be awarding contracts um, or awards um, to agencies as we receive applications. So we are potentially going to consider additional factors in ensuring that we meet the needs across the entire um, system. And so we're looking at geography, program specialty area, and the ability to serve specific subpopulations, which in this case are uh, CHA residents. And we'll make recommendations for contract awards within community areas like you said, balancing program location, target population, age group, and program specialty area. And this all just means we take a lot of things into consideration as we grant these awards. Um, so just to, for the, I don't know, sometime, um, for the maybe third, fourth time, emphasizing the importance of meeting the deadline for applications, um, today's a pre-proposal webinar, you have until July 28th to submit your proposal questions. So if anything comes up, I don't see any questions right now, but if anything comes up uh, between now and then, and then feel free to email me, feel free to email Julia, you can call the help desk, which she's gonna give that information out um, if you're having logistical or technical issues, uh, but anything related to programmatic aspects, we will take that those questions and put them in what we call an amendment uh, and publish that as part of the RFP. Um, and so there have been a lot of really good questions and other RFPs and we anticipate the same now, um, but you do have until July 28th. And then applications are due August 25th at noon. Again, please do not wait until August 25th at 9 a.m. to begin your application. Um, one thing that I want to note now that we may know again um, in follow-up emails is if you are submitting for different community areas, you are submitting for multiple community areas, you have to submit multiple RFPs, which means that you have to have 
multiple accounts in our iSupplier um, website or in our iSupplier system. Uh, page 21 and 22, section three, I believe, uh, goes through that in detail. It tells you that you do need to have different accounts for each RFP that you submit. You can't just reuse one and submit it for a different community area if you intend to serve different community areas. So it's a big lesson learned from this go around that just closed today. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free, like I said, to reach out to me or Julia. Um, and the program period will begin January 1st of 2020. One more reminder. <laughs> It bolded in red. Um, and now I'll pass it over to Julia, who's going to walk you through the technical aspects of the system and submitting an application. I thought that maybe we could take a, just a minute if, if anybody had any questions that they wanted to ask now while the programmatic sure. aspects of the RFP were still fresh. Please put your questions in the question box and we'll, we can maybe take a break to, look, to answer those. In the meantime, um, I'm Julia Talbot. I'm going to be walking you through how to make an application or how to make do your application in the city of Chicago's e-procurement environment. Um, we just spent a, a heady morning with people making applications in e-procurement. And so I feel like I'm particularly in touch with where people where people really need to where there's lessons learned, I guess, as as, as uh, Maria indicated. So I'm not seeing any questions being asked right now. So I'm just gonna go, oh, here we go. I knew like if I, the minute I said that, that it would be somebody, somebody who had a question. Um, so is partner collaboration encouraged? And is there to connect, I think, is there a way to connect with those seeking value partners? It's a great question. Yes. We do encourage partner collaboration. Um, if it is a partnership where you're both seeking funding through one application, I think that's one option. Um, other options that are more typical for us is one organization seeks the funding, um, but has uh, MOUs or linkage agreements with other uh, agencies or organizations in that community area that are agreeing to provide some kind of service or some kind of support to the young people that are served in the program. So there's an opportunity in the application to submit uh, material to submit those kinds of materials and allow you to explain what kind of partnership it is that you're intending to uh, to have with that collaboration partner. Yeah, Julia, you want to great question. Thank you. Other questions? Um I think I'm going to get just get started walking through the application portion, and if I see questions, we'll have time for. Oh, are there new programs? Are new programs eligible to participate? Yes, of course. We welcome new programs. We are opening this opportunity for funding because we are seeking um, new programs, improved programs, returning programs. Uh, if you meet the program requirements and criteria, we encourage you to apply for this opportunity and others as well. That is actually where we, even though some of our federal funding uh, is, allows us to enter into longer contracts by, by rule, we at the city of Chicago tend to turn our contracts over every other year, or every three years, so that we are able to keep new people or welcome new people into the fold and in, you know, give them an opportunity to provide services. Um, oh, <laughs> another thank you. Um, so there you go. And then um, I don't. Let's see if there's any other questions. So for all of those new programs out there, if you've never done business with the City of Chicago, you're going to need to start an I Supplier account. And we use the iSupplier account, which is the vendor platform really, to access e-procurement. E-procurement, which used to be called FMPS, is, you, is where the city houses all of its contract sort of operations. And so that includes 
RFPs, but more importantly, for those who have contracts, it's where you voucher, it's how you manage and keep track of what on the voucher is being approved, where that where that check has gone to or where, you know, when it's gone. Um, people in, you know, the iSupplier, which is the vendor platform that is used to access e-procurement, is managed by the applicant or the vendor. So when you set up an iSupplier account, it is yours to, to, to manage. Um, I can only stress to people, as somebody who's just answered a couple of questions, make sure that more than one person, you can have multiple contracts in the iSupplier account that can make, it can do multiple operations in, uh, in e-procurement, but make sure that the person that has that master account, make sure that more than one person has access. More than one person knows that login or that password, because if that one master account holder goes on vacation or quits or leaves your organization for whatever reason, and they don't tell you the uh, password, it's gonna be very, very difficult for you to access that account to switch in people or deactivate people. Um, I do generally get phone calls where people can't get in or they are having a hard time. And when I go in and look at their contacts, I can tell that nobody has really been actively managing that iSupplier account. And that makes it down the line harder for people to make good applications Right, when you have to wade through a million people that should have been deactivated or somebody forgot a password. And let me just say, I'm pretty sure from the number of calls I've gotten over the years that when somebody leaves their place of attendance for whatever reason, passing on the iSupplier passwords low on the list. It kind of very rarely happens. Um, so just, I would just say at this point, make sure two or three people in your organization at all times knows that iSupplier password and that will give, will make your dealings in iSupplier and your management of your iSupplier account all be happier. And you'll have the account working for you as opposed to you kind of working for the account. Um, when just as sort of an overview, all of our RFPs, the application questions, the selection criteria, and the evaluation tools that come out of those things are all connected. So. I always tell people to review our RFP narratives and our RFP documents. I know they're dense. They're not easy reading. Um, I find them interesting, but maybe I'm in a minority. Um, but they are chock full of really important information about the program, about what the program will and won't do, who can apply, how much money you're going to get, and how to make an application correctly. Um, I know not a lot of people read these documents as evidenced by sometimes when I read people's application answers or they're just the kinds of questions that we get. Um, but I really do encourage you to read them. I know that it, maybe they're not the most exciting thing you've ever read, but um, they are chock full of information and so, so much direction. So in terms of like when people, if, you're have a, if you have a question on sort of like how you should pursue or what avenues you should pursue, any particular application question, I always tell people to refer to that RFP for guidance. Look at the program requirements. Look at you know what this what we're looking for in terms of descriptions. That would give you a guidance of the kind of the right questions or the right direction rather to pursue in terms of crafting a program model that will that is both useful for your organization and community, but also is fundable by us. Um, I also say carefully review the selection criteria. That selection criteria, each question in the application directly goes to one of the selection criteria in our evaluation uh, table. And from those, those application questions and that selection criteria, we're going to build our evaluation tool. And so it's really important that you make sure that when you answer your question, that you're kind of keeping in alignment with the selection criteria that the question relates to. And it should be pretty obvious which, which uh, selection criteria goes with which application question. There's usually some key words in there that will, that will help. Um, so that's, those are kind of big picture guidance. Then I also wanna tell people, there's a 4,000 character limit which includes punctuation and spaces. That means each response is allotted 4,000 characters, not 4,000 characters total. The 4,000 character limits about a two-thirds of a single spaced page, if you're just kind of looking for a visualization there. 
the e-procurement system is not going to tell you when it's cutting you off, when you've exceeded those 4,000 characters. That is why I tell people, always, 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 please write your application answers and do those checks in the word processing software of your choice. Keep those answers because once you submit your application to us, you will not see it again. Uh, there's a printable view and we can, I will show you how to get to that, but you're not gonna, even the printable view will be a PDF and you're not gonna be able to access your, your language in the way that you might, in the way that it might be helpful for you for subsequent RFP or, or applications that you need to do. Additionally, don't use the back button on your browser. Um, if you do that, e-procurement is going to pretend that it's working for you, but eventually you'll get an error message. And when you go back, re-log in, it will have not saved anything that you did since you hit that back button. Um, generally speaking, the e-procurement was built on the now extinct Internet Explorer platform. It works pretty well in every other uh, Internet platform, although in this particular round, I found that sometimes there were a couple of people that were really having a hard time getting it to save and work for them. This is why we always say start early and save often. E procurement, the e procurement system is a very solid system. It goes, um, it has, I, I've been working in it for about five or six years now. It really doesn't crash. It generally speaking does what it's supposed to do. And it's, it, most of the bugs have been taken out of it. That being said, when we have these big RFPs and we get a lot of applications in, there's always a couple of people that have are having a problem because it's their computer is just doesn't, there's something about the way that your computer is set up, the software you're using or the internet platforms you're using that is not working with e-procurement. And for the life of me, I can't figure out what exactly it is, but I, and it's a very small percentage of people you know, it's sort of like 1%. So if I get 100 applications, there's one person having this problem, but it's still, you feel bad for that one person and you don't want to be it. So that being said, that's what I, you know, when we really, when we say starter early save often, I cannot tell you to I stress this enough. It, you will be so much happier if you can start early, if you save often, if you we have a due date, that's August 25th for this particular RFP. Please, please, please submit the day before. Do not think that, you know, it seems like you're really tempt everybody's really tempting fate if you think that you're gonna go in at eleven o'clock on something that's due to us at twelve and have it be perfect and go smoothly. <laughs> um, tips for working in a procurement, as um, Maria said earlier, if you need to submit more than one proposal, which is allowable for this RFP, you are going to need to submit that each proposal under a separate, unique register account within your iSupplier account, or, you know, account user with online bidding responsibilities within the organization's iSupplier account using that individual login information. So if you are submitting three applications, you need to set up three accounts that have bidding responsibilities or bidding permissions, you know, one for Ernie, one for Bert, and one for Big Bert. Uh, they all can go to the same email address, but they need to have unique user ID, you know, user named, or else e-procurement is not going to accept it. If you try to submit multiple applications just using one user account, it is going to archive the last application. And I you saw that with, a, I think, at least two people this morning where they submitted three things. And what you see is that Applicant, they submit application one, they go in and they submit application two on the same, you know, under the same uh, user account, and it basically archives that first application and writes over <laughs> and submits the second. So when we look at it, you've only submitted one application, but you have two other archived, you know, ones that now are registered sort of as like mistakes. So please, please, please pay attention to this. If you want to make multiple applications, you need to get three different accounts within your iSupplier account. You don't need three different iSupplier accounts. You just need to go into your contacts and set up three different accounts that allows you to do that. Um, that being said, you can submit your application and later amend it up until the due date of August 25th. So you can go in, you can practice submitting if you're a new person to the system, 
And then you can pull that application back. The application that is that you pull back will be quote unquote will appear as being archived in our view. You know not to touch it. Um, and then you can do your updates. You can make your changes, and you can do that up until the due date in the due time. After that, you can't touch it. But before then, go for it. Um, as I said, avoid the rush of possible mishaps by submitting early. Plan on your submission taking a 30 to 60 minutes. I tell people to do it the day before. Writing, our, writing grants is stressful enough. Why make the application experience even that more stressful? Have it be a relaxed experience where you can you know, say a proper goodbye to your beautiful application. Um, one of the reasons that we're telling you all of these things is that late applications are not accepted. We cannot review an application that we do not receive through the e-procurement system, and the e-procurement system does not do extensions. If we do an extension for one person, we do it for every person, and generally speaking, that, has, that hasn't happened in a couple of years. More likely, we would, re we would repost the entire RFP, and that would mean that everybody who had already applied would have to reapply. And we don't want that to happen. We don't want to do that. It's not fair to those who got their thing in, on time. So to that end, really start early, submit, you know, save often, and try to get those things in the day before. Um, if you need help, and many of us do, uh, at least in, you know, in the e-procurement world, you can, there's a hotline at 312-744-4357. You can also email them and the email is on the next slide. Please note that the hotline operates during business hours only Monday through Friday, nine to five. You can also call me and my app contact information is both in the RFP document as well as on the last slide of this PowerPoint. It's easy enough to get a hold of me. I often work different hours than Monday through Friday, nine to five, although I definitely work those too. Um, and sometimes I check my emails at off hours if I know that there's going to be a lot of people who potentially have any problem. We really, our goal is to get as, or at least my goal, is to get as many people to apply for these RFPs as possible. I know that we do not always have the most user-friendly system, so we want to give you all the supports that you need. Um, it helps us do a better job for you if you let us do, if you give us some time to do it. Understand that the hotline system and sometimes my time is being split between this RFP and any number of other RFPs that my department is going out or throughout the city in the case of the hotline. So just because, and this is another reason to take do that submission of the day early, is that if you do need help, you might have to wait in line to get it or somebody's going to have to call you back. Um, I make a point of calling everybody back or, or emailing them back within 24 hours, if not sooner. The e-procurement hotline does the best they can do. Uh, sometimes their, their lines are a little bit longer, but they also have a higher um, level of access into the e-procurement system. And so if, if you run into some serious problems, they are the people that are going to be able to escalate your problem um, to, to a different, you know, to a higher level and have things to check into. It's important then to give yourself the time to have, if you have a problem that's going to be escalated, and no one ever plans for this because why, why would it? It's against human nature. But I can guarantee you the people that had problems this morning that needed their problems escalated were not, you know, they were not able to make their submission because sometimes it takes more than three hours to figure out what's going on or to even get it into the right queues. Um, in terms of technical assistance, if you're looking to find out what more BFSS is doing for in the RFP world, and this year alone, I just counted today, we've already released 23, 23 RFPs this year. So we have a lot going on. Um, I highly recommend that you go to the DFSS webpage. There's a link to funding opportunities, and we always post all the funding opportunities under the funding opportunity link, but also in the alerts section. Um, you would be able to click and alerts on the RFP that seems interesting to you. Remember for this RFP, the, this is being recorded, the link to the, to the YouTube video that this will result in, and the PowerPoint slides 
are going to be posted at the bottom of the funding opportunity. And that's a standard place. They all get just posted at the bottom. You scroll down, it's sort of like the legal ad gets posted and the information. And then at the bottom, it will say, hey, you want to you want to see the webinar? Click here. You want to look at the PowerPoint slides? Click here. The amendments that we do are going to be po are going to be posted only on the e-procurement website. So if you're looking for the amendment, that's going to be posted in e procurement. And we'll talk about how to do amendments or get, get a hold of that information next. Uh, just to finish up here, so you want to email, you want you need to get a hold of the helpline, it's customer support at cityofchicago.org or 312-744-4357 or help. Uh, I think that's easy to remember. If you're a person that really hates talking to other people about these things, there's a lot of training materials. Um, doc, both PowerPoints, you know, slides, screenshots, and videos at this website. You can also email me, and I can send you a link, or I can also half the time uh, I have these on my desk, and I can send them to you. So now we're going to just talk about two very, very common things that you're going to do in the e-procurement environment, and I want to just walk you through these slides so that you have a little bit of familiarity when you and you, hopefully you go and do them yourself. The first is how to accept amendment, and then the other we walk, I'll walk you through is the submission process. So as Maria sort of talked, said prior, we do amendments to amend the RFP most of the time, probably like 90 to 95% of the time, we're doing an amendment to post the questions that were asked during the webinar and the ones that, in, that we will receive pre or, or post webinar about the program and we just provide clarifying information. If we ever needed to um, extend the deadline, we would do it through an amendment. If we find a mistake, we do that through an amendment. If we make a change <laughs> in a question or we need to make a substantive change to the RFP, we will also do that through the amendment document. To, um, there is no way that you can actually make an amendment, make an application once an amendment has been posted without accepting and this is how you do it. So in these screens, you're going to see, this is if you were going in to e-procurement to um, start an application. Under normal circumstances, you wouldn't get this warning. It would just say, it, it wouldn't say anything. And you would go to this actions bar on the right-hand side and hit the create, create quote and hit go. That is how you would be starting your application process. If there is amendment, you'll get this warning saying you need to view the amendment history. So to start the process of accepting the amendment, and that's really all you're going to do, you're going to be able to do. The system is not going to allow you to start an application without accepting the amendment. You're going to click on this view amendment history, and then it's going to take you to this, this next page. So to begin the acceptance and acknowledgement process, you're going to look, you can look at a couple of different things. Over here under the document number, you're going to be able to view the amended, uh, you're going to look at the RFP in total. You're not gonna be able to start an application, but you can look at that. Um, over here in the middle, you can see this there's this, this one this little, little one sentence amendment description, so you know what you're getting yourself into or why we're posting an amendment. And here under uh, bubble you know, under two with this little eyeglass or infinity icon, if you click on that, you're gonna see the actual amendment document itself. Um, I really suggest that you at least peruse it and see if there's something that it, that, you know, you probably might learn something new. Uh, and that there's, but, you know, there's usually like interesting clarifying questions. And after you've done all those things, you're going to acknowledge the amendment. By acknowledging the amendment, you are indicating that you were aware of the changes made in the RFP, in, you know, it, by that amendment. Um, you'll see in subsequent slides that the city of Chicago, we're very, in, we're very interested in making sure that you understand that you're going to be held responsible for the information in that amendment. Um, so when you click the, uh, that, that prior acknowledgement button, you're going to come now to this the acceptance button. You're going to come now to this acknowledgement, which you're going to accept the terms and conditions here with this very tiny button. And then you're going to hit acknowledge. So you've accepted, and now you're acknowledging that you're accepted. And then after that, they're going to ask you to confirm the acknowledgement of your acceptance. I don't know why I'm going to no, but they give you to you as an option. And then you'll hit yes here. That will bring you to this final page where you accept the terms and conditions. 
Um, so after you accept the terms and conditions by checking this little box, you're going to hit the accept button on the upper or lower right hand side here. And then, then your life will probably be complete because you've accepted the amendment. When you accept the amendment and you've already started an application, by going through these slides, you will pull all of the information you already have submitted or you know, as part of the application, not submitted or at least started in the application, will be pulled into the amended RFP. So you're not gonna have to redo your work. It will pull whatever you've done before. So there's really no, there's no reason not to start an application prior to the amendment since we just have talked to you endlessly about how we really want you to submit, you know, start early and save often and submit early. So now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to submit the application. So when you are done and you are ready to submit, you're going to save your draft one last time because why not save everything compulsively? And then you're going to hit this continue button. When you hit continue, the e-procurement system is basically going to take a real quick scan of your work. They're not looking for content. They're just basically looking for things that you might have missed. Um, I can't stress this enough. We're going to go through the two most common error messages. So here it says the RFQ control requires you to quote on all lines. You'll note here in this blow up that there's this lines thing right under tab, right underneath that error message. In this case, we don't look at the lines in the evaluations part of the app of this process. Lines, the lines section comes into play post application during contracting, but we but the system is going to want you to put a placeholder number. So you put in your birthday, you put in your lotto numbers, you put in the numbers from your from your budget if you want. It doesn't really matter. But you do need to put some kind of number in there or you're going to get the error message. Once you put once you, you you put a number in those boxes, then that error message goes away and you don't have to worry about it. The second error message that I like to go through here is this quote value is required for requirement first name. This is e procurement speak. Quote value is the e procurement quick answer. Requirement refers to the application questions, and the specific application questions all have a name. So in this case, what they're saying is you did not fill out the you know, text box for first name. Please fill that out. Um, so if you get that error message, you just, it means that you, know, you, you skipped a box. Um, and so those are the two most common error messages that people get. Um, hopefully you'll remember this if you do get, get, the, get the error message. After, uh, so after you have done all of the rectifying of your error messages, when you hit this continue, it's going to, the continue, you're going to be put into this review and submit phase. Now, at this point, you can see there's this printable view button on the right hand side, and you're going to hit printable view. That's going to give you a PDF of all of your answers for, for your files. Um, as I said, you're not going to, it's going to be a PDF. It's not the most manipulatable PDF in the universe. So I really, really highly encourage that you keep, you know, you keep your answers in a more flexible file format. But then you will have a printable view. You will see what you have submitted. You will get a list of all of your attachments. And that is useful because once you press the send button or the submit button, that's you're not going to have access to your application really. We will see it, but you will not. Um, and we can't send it back to you. Uh, although we could we can send you a PDF. So after this, you're going to hit review and submit. And at this point, you're really just going to be scrolling through your entire application. So you'll see the quote values, you'll see your answers. And when you get all the way down to the bottom of the page, you'll have a place where you can put, do an electronic signature. You're gonna put in your name and your title first, and then you're gonna click the box. Uh, if you click the box first, you get an error message saying that they wanted you to put your name and your title in first. And then because I could not fit it all on one screen, you'll simply look over to the right, and here is a submit button that once you do the electronic signature will become pressable. After you press submit, you should get this confirmation screen. Uh, the e-procurement system will send a confirmation email within 24 hours of your submission. But if you want something like more on top of it, if you really just wanna know right away, 
just call or email me. It's not a problem. I'm happy to look up and verify that we received your submission. So that really concludes everything I have to say about e procurement. Um, if you have program questions, or you can contact Maria for non programmatic questions, such as why is e procurement doing whatever it's doing, or what do I do about this? And the other thing, you can contact me. And now we're going to have, we have some time left over for additional questions um, about really whatever you want concerning this RFP. So, um, in the meantime, though, I can't thank you guys enough for coming to this webinar. And we're so, I mean, I, I have a, spe there's a special place in my heart for these enrichment programs. They do so much for Chicago's youth. Um, and they, I think they're, you know, they're a really good launching place in terms of fitting in with the kinds of programs for youth that the city is able to offer in terms of people can start with their enrichment programs and then graduate to the summer jobs programs and, you know, hopefully beyond. No. Are there any other comments from, for, uh, on that note? Thank you, Julia. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, we look forward to seeing your applications if you decide to submit. And um, one final reminder, don't forget to submit early. Please. Have a great day. Much for coming. And if there are no questions, we're going to end this webinar. Um, and yeah, we look forward to seeing your applications on August 25th. We really look forward to seeing them on August 25th actually but there you go uh thank you for all my colleagues here for attending and have a wonderful rest of your tuesday <laughs>